hardest and challenge and challenge topics, as everyone know. And uh, this actual question is coming to me from all residents or fellows and interns. How to approach crying? The mother, the father will bring his baby. Okay, what's wrong? He is crying. Why? We don't know. Then this is your job to find why. Actually, we'll try to, uh, to cover these uh, topics during this presentation from introduction to epidemiology. Then we'll move to differential diagnosis, emergency evaluation, diagnostic study, observation, treatment, and last will be disposition. Uh, actually, crying is a common behavior of infancy that can be a signal of a broad spectrum condition, range of, from normal needs up to significant medical or surgical pathology. This is the sole myth, method of medical communication for infants. When the baby is hungry, he will cry. When he's in pain, he will cry. When he is distressed, he will, he will cry. When he wants to sleep, he will cry. This is the only mode of communication for him. Understanding the management continues to be a, a big challenge for both the parents and the caregiver provider. For the parents, often they have a sense why their baby is crying and they can distinguish. Is it because of hunger or fatigue or something more serious? When the crying button deviates from the normal and when they are exhausted, no more effort to counsel the baby, then they will seek medical advice. Remember, the parents will be anxious, sleep deprived, troubled, and in need for care and reassurance. So the provider must determine timely and cost-effective strategy for evaluating these infants. Epidemiologically, <clears throat> actually studies have reported a percent, uh, percentage of uh, all annual ED visits for effort crying, ranging from 0.25 to 13.6 percent. A uh, big study was by Brazil in 1962, an infant crying in the primary care setting, found that an average infant will cry in the first 12 weeks of age, uh, with a period of one to four hours each day, with a peak of six to eight uh, weeks, and improvement approximately by the age of 10 weeks. The incidence is estimated to be 1.5 to 43 percent of the population. As we see, this is a wide variation. It's largely due to conflicting definitions of excessive crying based on the parental perception and assessment. Some parents, they have very low threshold for dealing with this crying. They will seek advice from very mild crying. Others, they have higher threshold to uh, manipulate this crying. So this is the cause of this wide variation of the incidence in the population. This is a Brazilian uh, study in 1962. As we see, the, usually they will start crying by two, two weeks of age with a peak of uh, six weeks and end by 90% so of them by four months, so it's 12 weeks. Uh, the reported difference of excessive crying, uh, resistant crying, uh, secondary organic cause is about five to 76 percent. Uh, 1991, uh, Paul reported, uh, reported that among the infant age less than one year presenting to, to the emergency department with acute and unexplained crying, 60% will have serious cause. More recently, in 2009, Friedman said 5.1 only of the patient will have serious underlying etiology, which is more reassuring for us. This graph for the taken for 68 infants who present uh, and about incidents, which time is more high for crying and found is the time between 5 p.m. and 10 p.m. Differential diagnosis. The differential diagnosis for crying is extensive, involves every organ from head to toe. With acute crying, the role of the physician, remember your role will start with three things. Avoid missing serious or life-threatening etiology, determine the common treatable diagnosis, and contain and be patient with the worried parents. Remember these three things. Avoid missing serious, find treatable diagnosis, reassure and contain the patient, contain the parents. As with all ED, the most likely uh, critical cause, it will be from, considered from 
critical to slight lipose. Uh, we have a very big list, but this is the most common life threatening cause of crying, starting with UTI, sepsis, non accidental trauma, dysrhythmia, especially SVT, congestive heart failure, bowel obstruction, interception, malrotation, and volvulus, pneumonia, testicular torsion, inborn error of metabolism, hypoglycemia, and dehydration. And we'll talk about most of these later on in our slides. Uh, the largest and most relevant study on crying in infant highlights the fact the majority of diagnoses accounting for unexplained crying are not serious, not life-threatening, and usually treatable. One of these uh, uh, studies, we have two studies, uh, uh, this study of Fahmi uh, of 200 uh, crying infant, and they found that the most common diagnoses were colic in 29.5%, Otitis media 15%, constipation 5%. Also, Friedman and Wall reported diagnosis as the most common with colic, reflux, viral illness, constipation, otitis media, and idiopathic crying. Uh, Calado also at all examined the reason for the neonatal visit to the emergency over one year, and excessive crying was the second most common reason for presentation about 13.6, with most diagnosis of non aberrant pathology, infant colic, physiological joints. So, this evidence and these studies should serve as reassurance for us that the most common complaints in acute crying infant are not serious and not life threatening. But keep in mind the serious things. Now we'll come to the second point. How can I differentiate? Is it serious or not? Uh, there is no single finding to predict a more serious etiology, more than less serious. Uh, uh, but parent and clinician, uh, parents, clinician, and patient features will guide the degree of concern and subsequently the further workup and investigation. How is that? First, let's say about parent and concern. Multiple studies documented that parents can recognize their child cry. I can't distinguish between the different causes of crying from hunger and fatigue up to distress and serious causes. Uh, Fandil Brawl in 2010, uh, with a retrospective review, uh, identified which clinical features were predicted for serious illness in children and parents' concern. The parents' concern found as a red flag with a likelihood ratio of 14.5 and confidence in the of 95. As with parents and caregiver concern, also higher degree of clinical concern has been shown to predict the likelihood that a patient has a more serious uh, condition. 2010, funding uh, parole said clinician concern regarding severity of illness was seen as strong as red flag for serious disease with positive uh, likelihood ratio of 23.5 and confidence interval of 95. Then about the patient himself, uh, 1991, both a uh, uh, study of 34 infants were judged to have a serious condition as a cause of their crying and conclude that persistent excessive crying in the emergency beyond the time of initial assessment was predictive of ser uh, serious illness with sensitivity of 100% and 77 specificity uh, and positive predictive value of 87%. The study found also that uh, if result of physical examination normal and the infant did not continue to cry uh, after the time of initial assessment and observation, serious illness are unlikely. Here a slide about the differential diagnosis. As we said, it's very big list diagnosis from head to toe, from the head down to the chest, cardiac, respiratory, uh, GI, genitory, musculoskeletal, derma, neurological, and skin, and others. Uh, we can choose the most important uh, from my little experience. 
regarding the head and to trauma and uh, especially head trauma, the trauma to the palate and uh, corneal abrasion from cardiac wise, this let me especially SVT. Myself, I remember two cases coming with irritability and found them to have SVT with heart rate of around 250 and 300. Uh, heart failure, they will present also. Uh, Respiratory wise, about foreign body aspiration, pneumothorax and pneumonia, GI wise, bowel obstruction, interception, GI, mal rotation, genitourinary is uh, torsion and urinary tract infection. Urinary tract infection, this is the most common serious cause. Uh, musculoskeletal, we'll talk about most of these later on in our slides. Evaluation, as usual, history first. Detailed and thorough history is crucial in making diagnosis and direct your further workout. Uh, the history has been reported as diagnostic in 20 up to 86% of cases alone or together with a physical examination. And just imagine up to 86% you can diagnose from history and examination. But uh, completing is a difficult, as you know, because of two reasons. The child is brief verbal, cannot provide information. The caregiver are anxious, uh, unable to give you a good description of the events that they make them presentation to the emergency. So obtaining history in a high acuity situation may be interrupted until the patient is stabilized. So you should start with your ABC. Many serious and life-threatening illness can present with crying and that your attention must be paid to the ABC. Recitation and stabilization measure must be implemented prior to the two or during the history taking process, which can contribute to ongoing care, give her anxiety, make collection of more information more difficult. So what I suggest, go and stabilize your patient, ask one of your junior specialists or resident to take, go and take a brief history while you are stabilizing the patient and together reassuring the family that you are taking care, but you need information to help you, to help guiding you regarding the, what is the situation. So we, we recommend an appropriate, age appropriate, thorough and systemic history taking. Initially, we can focus on this during the uh, acute situation with the parents uh, who are uh, anxious and uh, the baby is crying or unstable during your stabilization. Ask somebody to take this uh, brief history. The present, as with all disease, the present history, the present illness, onset, duration, frequency, time, what has been done and what is the outcome, uh, association with other activity and behavior, the serving of sleep, feeding, and any brief history of similar episode. Go back to birth history, any risk factors, the gestational age, the birth weight, uh, screening results, any drug use during pregnancy, uh, feeding and intake, frequency, uh, how many times, uh, amount, uh, the sucking, is it good or not, uh, any difficulties, type of formula, how preparing the formula, uh, ask about stool and urine, is it normal voiding? Is there any difficulties? Uh, past history of tract, unit tract infection, uh, past medical history of any other illness or hospitalization before the development, uh, any recent medication given, and herbal medication also, about the immunization status of the baby, the family history, and social as other illnesses. This is, as beginning, will give you a light and guide you where to go. Later on, after a stabilization, you can take more detailed history. Uh, then we'll go for physical examination. It's both acceptable and it's worth limited and focus. When the range of the possible treatment is long and potentially life-threatening for crying, more thorough and phys system physical examination is recommended. So start with limited, start with general condition, vital signs, uh, mental status, DCS, pupils, uh, chick, uh, cardiac respiratory. Then after stabilization, you can go more detailed examination. Larger studies demonstrate that the physical examination is instrumental in making the diagnosis 
And final diagnosis, up to more than 50 cases percent, 50 percent of the cases, alone or together with the history. This is a clinical pathway. This is the, one of the important slides for me. We'll take it one by one. First, as we said, ABC, vital signs, general condition, is it patient stable or not? Patient not stable, okay. You will deal with him as any sick patient, IV line, uh, cardiomyopathy monitoring, uh, glucose shake, oxygen, IV fluid bolus, and uh, continuous observation, and possibly ICU admission. If your patient is stable, the second question, is he febrile or not? If he is febrile, this is straightforward. A febrile infant, they are dealing with as febrile infant guidelines. If the patient is not febrile, is the history and examination uh, findings give you a source of illness or injury? If yes, so put your differential diagnosis and do your labs and investigation and your plan depending on that. If no, from the history and examination, we'll go to the other question. Is he toxic or ill appearing? If yes, put your differential diagnosis and deal with him as that. If not toxic, uh, no injury and no diagnosis, if a brile is stable, we'll go to the last. Try to calm baby down, start to try to stop his crying. If he calm down, just observe, bear from re, uh, serial examination, re-evaluation, and depending on the next step, you decide either is he for admission or discharge, and we'll talk about this one more detailed in the next slides, inshallah, later on. Uh, we'll try quickly for, from my point of view, I think this is the most common causes, okay, of the, have a very long list, almost maybe more than 30 or 40, and we'll have, we need many times, many long time to uh, talk about it, but I choose actually the most common presentation of crying infant that we discover with crying infant. We'll take with them uh, quickly one by one. We'll start from head and neck. We'll start from head up to toe. First is coronary abrasion. Uh, the number of study and case reports investigate the relationship between excessive crying and the presence of a coronary abrasion. There have been conflicting data actually regarding the excessive crying that can be directly attributed to the presence of coronary abrasion versus the incidental. Act is it really the cause of crying or just incidental? And there is another cause. Uh, uh, Ball and Harkinis published data identifying coronary abrasion as a likely cause for crying in number of infants. But other larger cohort studies have not supported the identification of coronary abrasion as a cause. Anyway, in the ED, if you have patient with uh, facial scratch, photophobia, excessive tearing, and for body, do your fluorescent uh, staining, uh, treat, keep him for observation. If calm down, okay, this is the cause and it has been treated. If it is still, look for other cause. Second, in the head and neck is acutotitis media. Multiple large studies have shown the acutotitis media to be one of the most common etiology, so highlight the need for thorough external and otos uh, otoscopic examination. Third, the head and neck, non-accidental trauma. Okay, non-accidental trauma and crying. Actually, the relation, each one can cause the other. The crying may cause, may lead to non-accidental trauma, as shaking baby syndrome, and refers, this trauma will cause crying. Uh, the head is one of the most commonly targeted area in abuse. Uh, the characteristics, uh, characteristics, uh, character of the abuse include bruising on the ear or neck in less than four years and bruising in any region for more than four months, less than four months, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> presence of these signs should promote evaluation from head to toe, head, skeletal system, and visceral organ. 1999, a study of 608 children less than two years present to the emergency with head trauma found that one third of them, 30%, uh, present had irritability with or without other focal. They present with crying only 30% out of 600 
babies. Just imagine, 200 babies of them present with crying with any, any other focal signs. So as I mentioned, it's both risk factor and manifestation. The crying may irritate one of the parents, then they will make non accident trauma or as shaken baby syndrome. The refers also the baby may be abused and this will this lead to a crying. Uh, study actually, uh, as in 2004, there is a study from uh, Netherlands report that 5.6 of the parents uh, smoothed or slapped or shook their infants at, one, at least once to stop their crying, 5.6%. There was a case report in 1992 uh, described the death of an infant secondary to abusive injury whose crying had initially attributed to the AD, he presented the AD first and he was discharged as a colleague. And the baby died, later on died because it was abused, not colic. So keep in mind, persistent crying, social factor or risk factors, plus physical examination finding, keep in your mind accidental trauma. As I mentioned, the relation between crying and shaking baby syndrome, this graph showing with the peak of the crying, there is a peak of the shaking baby syndrome. Once the cry start to decrease by the age of the four, uh, four months, the shaking baby syndrome is, uh, risk or incidence of it also going down. Uh, number four in, auto, in head and neck is autolaryngeal pathologies. It's less common cause, but remember, retropharyngeal cellulitis may be, uh, has been identified as a case of crying in infant. Also, trismus testiculus in infant should raise its concern for virtual cellular abscess, deepening space infection, Detaining and distorting. We finish with from head and neck, we'll go to thoracic part. First is clavicular fracture. A neonate uh, can occur during delivery, actually. And usually it's mid-clavicular. But if it was difficult delivery uh, with shoulder dystocia and the fit, uh, with large, uh, big baby, most likely this is accidental. But if clavicular fracture identified in non-ambulatory event outside the neonatal period with a history of with the risk factor for uh, without risk factor for birth trauma, as we said, the large uh, weight, uh, large weight, uh, with no risk factor, this should raise the concern for non-accidental. So it's clavicular; it could be accidental, and accidental, depending on the birth history and the birth weight and other risk factors. Second, in the risk is vertebral stomatitis and discitis, less common cause uh, of scrying. However, certain studies have found that this uh, pathology can have non specific finding in infant and to the animal present with crying and irritability. There will be localized in darkness, the vibration over the affected area, or decreased range of motion of the spine due to pain. Third, in the the thoracic is rib fracture. Uh, should also, uh, rib fracture have been identified as a cause of crying in infant and should raise the suspicion of an accidental trauma. An examination, you will find it as a pony step off or a crepitus of the affected area. While uh, there can be a rib fracture in the presence of birth, uh, birth trauma, metabolic bone disease, cardiac uh, CBR, they are quite rare cause in infant. Uh, rib fracture first is rule out non-accidental trauma. Then think about these less likely causes. Uh, mastitis, breast tissue also should be examined for possible breast mass, abscess, and cellulitis. So we finish from head and neck. We finish from uh, thoracic. We'll go to heart and cardiovascular. Arrhythmia in 1991, uh, well study, two of six, 56 infants presenting with crying was found to have SVT. Myself, I saw twice, one with a 200 heart rate and another one with 300. They came to the uh, discovery that the triage was just complaining, crying, and irritability. Also, congenital heart disease and heart failure. Infant with uh, congenital heart disease may present with irritability, crying, uh, irritability, crying, uh, trouble with feeding, sweating during feeding, etc., as you, everybody know. There was a case report of infant with anomalous of left coronary artery present with non-specific signs, crying, 
and another also report of 12 weeks old infant who presented with chief complaint of paroxysm of irritability and found later on to have anomalous left coronary artery originating from the pulmonary artery. We'll finish from cardiovascular, we'll go to abdomen. For me, abdomen is the, uh, the most common causes for a crying infant is in the abdomen. Either it's constipation, Hirschbrug, sorry, and uh, malrotation. So we'll take, talk to them about them one by one. Constipation, multiple large studies show that constipation may be one of the most common causes. Can be easily diagnosed by history and careful examination of the abdomen. About digital rectal exam, this emergency may consider if indicated by the clinical suspicion. If you want to rule out is this constipation or Hirschberg. Hirschberg, the etiology should be considered an infant with history of constipation, uh, empty rectal palate, and digital examination. So we may perform the rectal, uh, digital examination just to differentiate is it constipation or Hirschberg disease. Uh, if there is still this is constipation, if no, this is Hirsch, most likely Hirschberg. Mal rotation and fall loss, very serious pathology, present with non-specific finding, irritability, crying, abdominal pain, and later the patient will develop the bilious emesis and bloody stool. We should consider further investigation, any patient present, uh, any ill patient who present with these signs. Uh, interception, there was a retrospective uh, chart review by Schill of 97 patients, uh, 97 uh, seven patients. Actually, everybody will know in subsection they will present with vomiting. They will present with the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, they are moving their legs and uh, uh, bouts. But 97, 97 patients, as we said, with inception found that while vomiting was the most common clinical presentation, 74 percent of these children initially present with crying. 74 percent. So the index, uh, they will usually present with a wave of crying, uh, apparent abdominal pain, vomiting, bloody stool, <clears throat> lethargy, intermittent flexing of the lower extremities. We finish with the abdomen. We'll go to genital urinary system. Here we'll talk about UTI, one of the most common co-serious etiology, an infant of crying. Uncircumcised male, as you know, is at higher risk. A multiple drug study found that occult UTI may present with crying and uh, fuseness in the absence of fever and other urinary symptoms. An infant with crying, please think about UTI. Uh, Friedman et al. of retrospective study of 237 crying infants, UTI was the most common underlying serious etiology for crying, especially less than four months out of 237 crying infants. Inguinal hernia. Uh, in 2006, there was a study report that when inguinal hernia present at the uh, birth, the risk of becoming obstructed within the first six months of life is as high as 60%. So consider trans elimination and uh, to differentiate between hydrocele and other causes of the swelling and ultrasound with the birth. Uh, extremities, septic arthritis, rare. However, they can be, uh, it was published in neonates with septic joint who present with crying, especially with di uh, changing the diaper. So any evidence of reducible pain with movement of the joint, swelling, erythema over the joint, you should do your further investigation. Okay. Uh, on, we'll talk about fracture before. CNS, why? Hypoglycemia and nervous irritability uh, can have a variety of uh, presentation, including jitteriness, uh, abnormal crying, irritability, poor feeding, and seizure. And older can be indicative uh, indication of inborn error of metabolism, infection, sepsis, pituitary, and adrenal dysfunction. Uh, so, you need the full uh, uh, genital urine examination should be performed for any antimolytic abnormalities and to rule out adrenal and hormone disturbance, especially congenital hyperplasia. Uh, Bitsagio cosmic germent, 
easy, minimally invasive phase that can give you a very uh, fast, important piece of information. Uh, CNS infection, irritability can present as a sign of serious infection prior to the development of fever. Uh, there are no focal findings to just, uh, suggest CNS infection, but the infant is ill appearing or has uh, continuous crying throughout the history and examination. Prolonged monitoring or admission with repeated vital sign should be considered. Uh, as we know, presentation of fever with irritability this will guide uh, appropriate workup with uh, antibiotic and admission in the presence of fever. But in 1999, Remember, there was a study of case series of six infants who with sepsis and whom the persistent crying was the, pre uh, the predominant manifestation for two to 10 hours prior to the appearance of, uh, appearance of fever. Yes, six cases. Go to skin, extremosis can be an accident trauma can be a cause of crying, and the evidence of this injury manifests as a new or old lesion in the skin. So full exposure of the infant during examination is important to identify this uh, science. Uh, okay, uh, survey, let's go no, just because of time, we can go. Burn, important. It's a cause of crying, but remember, it could be caused by an accident trauma. A uh, burden of the bear in the shape of hot objects such as a cigarette or immersion of part of the body into a hot, hot liquid, most com uh, consistent with accidental, uh, with the non accidental than the accidental. Uh, the majority of the accidental are scaled, which are generally pulled over uh, scaled, or carrying the child pull over a container of fluids as a container on a table, and he will pull. Uh, the cover of the table, then the fluid will come in him. But this burn tend to affect the face, upper limb, anterior trunk, and upper back, also and neck. They are asymmetrical, irregular edge, and irregular depth. But for the uh, uh, non-accidental, they have symmetrical shape, uh, regular edge, and regular depth, as with cigarette smoking and immersion in hot uh, liquids. So we finish with the emergency department evaluation. The question now, what about diagnostic studies? We finish with the history, with the examination, with the observation. And we, have, we, we, uh, we examined the patient from head to toe. What is the role of the diagnostic studies? About laboratory testing, actually history and physical examination should be used to determine the appropriate diagnostic study in the evaluation of the crying infant. Window shopping approach, expensive, invasive, and may not result in diagnosis. So the age of the patient plus history, examination, usually will lead to the correct diagnosis or if not a definitive one. <clears throat> but remember, neonate is exceptional. Neonate is exceptional. The one exception of the neonate, uh, of the window shopping approach is the neonate who's irritable, poor feeding, decreased activity, and decreased uh, sleeping, this infant is ill regardless of the vital signs. He may present with this presentation, then he will deteriorate and uh, his vital signs will deteriorate. The differential diagnosis is very uh, long, but the most common is the infection. Remember the incidence of serious bacterial infection in the first month of life is about up to 13.3%. So they demand full septic screen, IV antibiotic, and admission. For the imaging, there is no, recomm no recommendation for routine use of any uh, kind of screen uh, for any kind of screening purpose. Uh, similar to the labs, imaging studies should be considered uh, for uh, individually for each patient based on the indication from the history and examination. But if you, you have another dating study like ultrasound and MRI are available, this may be appropriate phase line <clears throat> study for this population if it's demanding uh, necessarily. <clears throat> so uh, we can diagnose the patient 
up to 80% of them from history and, and examination. Careful, focused, thorough history and full examination from head to toe, they can give you a diagnosis up to 80% of the patient. Then the remaining 20, it will come from the observation, re-examination and investigation. So remember please, laboratory and radiology is not very helpful, especially it's invasive, expensive and wasting of time and you may end with nothing. Focus on your history, examination, observation, these three things. Uh, we'll finish and go to observation. If you, uh, history and examination not re uh, relieving or if initial testing is not indicated or inform not informative, a period of observation in the ED will be helpful. This allow for a new feature of, to manifest like fever and uh, other signs of acute abdomen like bilious vomiting and bloody stool. Allow the emergency doctor time to observe the infant behavior and crying and may guide the use of additional diagnostic tests and disposition plan. For how long? There is no defined number of hours in the literature to observe a crying infant. Each ER physician must decide the appropriate number of hours to observe and re-examine. Uh, I remember one case yesterday, just yesterday, came with crying. Uh, she just fall. Initially, she was very irritable, family was very anxious. I asked him to calm down for half an hour, especially her vital signs are okay. CNSYC is okay, no any uh, signs of trauma. We kept her for a while. After half an hour, I came back. I asked them to start moving her limbs. I saw a limitation of one of the limbs. We did the x-ray, we found a fracture. As simple as that. Just take your time once your patient is stable and not ill. Treatment. By the end of the evaluation, you will have three types of patients. If one with who calm and return to normal behavior, and the one with a recognizable treatable illness, and the third one, infant who continue to cry without clear diagnosis. And this is the gray area. This is the difficult area. For type one, they will be discharged home after reassurance with the parents and the clear plan when to return back. For type two, this, uh, the disposition or admission depends on the diagnosis. Let's say within a uh, two month old with UTI, this one for admission, with SVT, this is one for admission. But one with a foreign body, maybe in the nose or in the ear, or uh, let's say within a hair I will treat it, I will discharge with clear brown when to come back. The more difficult plan is for those who cry to continue, uh, continue to cry without any cause. For this type, those we uh, for this type three, we have two types. Those who meet criteria for admission, then their treatment will be guided by further observation and examination by our colleague in, 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 in uh, inpatient. So he's for admission. They have a crying baby with no diagnosis, but not candidate for admission. What he will do? I will keep for observation for a while. Then once I have a good feeling with my, my uh, examination, vital signs, and basic uh, investigation, everything is okay. I may discharge the patient, okay, but with clear outpatient follow up in 24 hours, uh, avoid this of any medication that might migrate the symptom and delay diagnosis or definitive treatment like uh, uh, FIFADOR or uh, FIFA medicine. I ask the family, don't give, please just check once there is FIFA, come back immediately. Don't give medication that it will. Uh, my, uh, mitigate uh, the symptoms and delay diagnosis. And there is to be aware of serious symptoms which to seek medical advice. So detailed and age appropriate instruction should be reviewed with the uh, caregiver for reason when to return back, like fever in less than three months of age, uh, through irritability, inability to eat or drink, inability to the caregiver himself when they feel they are stressed and cannot handle and deal, ask him to come back. Don't force him to a point that he will abuse it, uh, the boy. Make it as an indication to come back. Any uh, new or concerning symptoms? Okay, last point, and we'll talk about it, is disposition. There is no evidence-based 
guideline to direct disposition of the infant who brings into the emergency with acute and unexplained crying. As with other chief complaint, disposition will largely be affected by the workup in the emergency department. <clears throat> again and again, again, a period of observation and emergency will be helpful to guide disposition plan, either admission or discharge. This is a criteria for admission and discharge. Who will admit toxic appearing, unstable, critically ill, clinically stable with need for IV therapy like fluids or antibiotic. They don't have access to immediate follow-up. Ongoing cry without clear etiology after examination and observation. Uh, social concern that they have poor support and safe environment risk factor for abuse and fail to meet uh, discharge criteria. Who to be discharged will appearing stable. Uh, they can access immediate follow-up. Uh, resolution of the crying in the emergency or incoming crying that's his baseline and not concerning for the parents. Uh, uh, no, social no social concern, parents are comfortable and they can deal with the situation. Uh, okay, as we said, any toxic, uh, unstable, critical ill, admit to the inpatient, uh, PICU, regardless of the diagnosis. Will appearing stable, no focal history examination, uh, no longer uh, crying, diagnosis is clear and uh, is uh, amenable for outpatient uh, therapy. Diagnosis is unclear but not concerning. Give him a follow up. As you see, the, the hardest is the disposition of the gray area, the type 3. Continue to cry, inconsolable, no clear cut diagnosis. I advise a period of observation in the emergency department, serial examination. Further testing, then at the end you will finish with type two, with one or two. Once you observe type three, see the examination for the testing, you can put him in type one or type two, as we have a clear plan for type one and type two. If it's still after all these measures, patient is in uh, type three, okay, uh, and uh, you cannot uh, uh, change him to type one or type two then better to go for admission for further evaluation, examination, and investigation. Uh, okay, as we see, I can make this one uh, just... Okay, as we said, type one, type two, type three. Uh, type one, calm and normal. Uh, reassurance of the parents, discharge, and when to come back. Ask uh, to the family when to come back. Uh, type two, we have a diagnosis, either you'll admit, even on the diagnosis, or you'll treat and discharge. Type three, as we said, crying with no diagnosis. If he is unstable, directly for admission. He's stable, I will observe, re-examine, further testing. Either he will change to type one or type two and have clear plan for them, or remaining type, uh, remaining, remain in type three, then I will proceed for admission. Okay, this is the last slide. Actually, I have a lot of message from this presentation. Usually, in my presentation, I will put two or three messages, but actually with this presentation, I have a lot of message. Please, avoid missing a serious or life-threatening etiology. Determine the common treatable diagnosis. Contain and be patient with the worried parents. The most common cause are not serious, but keep them serious in your mind. Parents can recognize their child and can they, they can differentiate between the different causes. Please trust them, especially the, the mother. Trust her feeling. Believe your concern. History and examination are crucial. Period of observation and emergency, it will be very helpful. And thank you. MashaAllah. Thank you very much, Dr. Nasser. Uh, I really like your approach. Uh, organized, systemic. Uh, from head to toe, uh, step-wise uh, management, that is very, very impressive, you know, and that's really a clear message for all seniors and, and uh, pediatric residents, how, how, how to deal and what to do with those patients. Dr. Nasser, uh, I have a comment from Dr. Haifa. Uh, she mentioned that the differential diagnosis is quite long, uh, and uh, can we add insect bites? Because, uh, you know, uh, during the summer, uh, have you seen any cases of insects bites uh, for those kids? Actually, uh, I don't think this is a common uh, cause. Of, a common cause of uh, irritability in infants. Yeah, it's localized pain. 
not that not that much not pain it will cause uh, irritability and crying yeah exactly you know like uh, you know toddler and above the 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 child who can walk around maybe at risk of insect bites but usually the infants you know they are really stay still in this side and that's why they are not really at that much risk uh, regarding the stable category three dr nasser stable category three you uh, that you did not reach the diagnosis you advise admission uh, any role for any role for short stay observation or for example as you know the governmental hospitals are overwhelmed with admissions for those cases as we uh, sorry for type type 3 as i mentioned type 1 is clear for all the chart type 2 uh, uh, depending on the diagnosis you will treat and the chart or you will admit type 3 if he's unstable the state forward admission if he's stable observe reassess and consider some investigation like uh, urine analysis. Okay, you can ask for uh, CBC, uh, CRP, if you have uh, indication for that. You will end with either you will change them to type one or two, uh, and two, and they have clear blood for it. Or still after all these steps, he's uh, still in type three. Okay, but to admit for observation and for the safety of the patient because you don't have a clear diagnosis and the patient still is crying. I see. Dr. Nasser, one question from a candidate regarding febrile patient, and if you are not sure that it's really viral or not viral from the initial investigations, would you recommend early antibiotic or you'd rather wait for more workup if you are unable to rule out a uh, viral infection? I will go with very serious analysis because one of the most common causes is UTI. I need to rule it out. If I have a UTI, then I will guide my uh, treatment to depend on the diagnosis. But if I did urine, let's say I did urine and it's came negative. So I may go for more invasive investigation, like CBC, CRB, to look for other cause of this fever. Then the CBC may give you an assurance it's viral or not. Yeah. And, uh, this talk is below three months. As we said, the guideline for a febrile infant, below three months. But above the three months, no. Fever is not the only uh, concern. We should look for other, about activity, uh, uh, feeding, these things. Yeah, to judge it or not. Thank you very much. Really, a very difficult topic, you know, and it's really common. We see it every day in the emergency department. Uh, Dr. Muhammad Al Uthman, uh, please, if you can highlight on, I have a question from Dr. Salman Al Asiri. He's asking about the vitamin A rule and measles patients, especially below two years. Do you recommend vitamin A below two years? Uh, please, if you can actually, highlight. Yeah, yeah. actually it's controversy to start with. So a recommendation is not that strong to use it. But sometimes with a severe disease, they may start to think about it, even though it's controversy. I mean, the evidence, there is no strong evidence about vitamin A in, in measles. I think. And uh, regarding uh, with Roseola, you know, if the patient is having irritability, uh, Dr. Mohamed Al-Uthman, can you highlight the management about Roseola infections if the child is unstable, having high-grade fever? How do you approach those kids, please? Yeah, uh, as I said earlier, uh, sometimes it's not that easy to diagnose Roseola uh, in Vantam, especially the first three days they presenting with high-grade fever and the irritability, sometimes poor oral intake. So CNS infection is one of your differential diagnoses. Shall we go for lumbar puncture or do those cases? I will not say, I will not say yes. So you have to go and uh, you may give a follow-up assessment. Be sure in the first sitting that those patients, they don't have CNS manifestation and anterior functionality is flat and uh, uh, head uh, and neck movement is okay. Well being of the child between those spikes, usually they were back to usual. They're the usual. They are not sick looking. Uh, except when they become febrile, usually they become like a bit lethargic, which is expected with any age where like with highly febrile to be a bit lethargic. Hey, thank you very much. Allah Yatik Really, I am very, very grateful for Dr. Mohammed Al Uthman, Dr. Abdullah Bahme, Dr. Nasr Al Isa. It has been uh, it has been a wonderful night. Thank you very much. Uh, all the qu questions and comments are really uh, telling you thank you for all of your efforts. And inshallah, we will download your great lecture uh, in our YouTube channel so everyone will watch it uh, at their uh, decent time. Uh, thank you very much. 
And uh, if you have any final advice, uh, Dr. Abdullah Ahmed, uh, for the residents and fellows. Thank you very much, actually, for your Dr. Tawfiq and for our uh, colleague speakers, and even for the part participants. Um, um, actually, this kind of educational event is very important, especially nowadays with uh, this kind of infection, the COVID-19. So uh, by this, uh, I mean, kind of event, we will not to stop the, the education and the uh, continuous medical education. So I, um, uh, I mean, I advise everyone actually from the uh, senior or juniors, or even, even the consultants actually, just to continue um, learning of such events uh, like uh, this program. And uh, finally, uh, I thank everyone uh, who are presented in this uh, program. Shukran, uh, Dr. Nasser, any advice uh, for your uh, resident and fellows? Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Thank you for your Tawfiq, Dr. Tawfiq. Thank you to my senior, Dr. Uthman, Dr. Bahmed. Uh, actually, I worked with them as a resident. I worked with them as a fellow. And really, it's very uh, great for me to present with them. And it's a very big jump and step in my uh, experience life. Uh, thank you also. Uh, as, uh, this uh, actually uh, this first um, picture for me online, but, but really it's very wonderful and uh, very good experience. Inshallah, I hope uh, we can make uh, more and more in the future. Barakallah, thank you very much. Yes, inshallah, we need you more in the future. We have so many coming lectures. Dr. Mohammed Al Uthman, uh, your advice for your senior residents and fellows, please. Um, first, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Tawfiq, for uh, inviting and moderating uh, this and have initiative to uh, give this for our participants. Uh, as continue learning, we have to keep it, especially with, uh, as uh, my colleague said, uh, ongoing situation and difficult to have life and class as, as usual we are doing so we are dependent on this and the advantage actually of webinar is you're going to have a lot of participants as I can see we have up to 300 plus participants which is not easy to bring them together uh, like if, if you planning to do it in one place uh, my advice is continue learning is should be there especially for resident and training post whereas most of the program now is like exposure is less uh, so they should compensate with such uh, activities uh, to catch up uh, knowledge and information.